Hello to everyone, a very warm welcome to you all. Um, I can see that there are so many different countries in the chat and it's wonderful for us all to be together at this time. I'm delighted to be a part of this. Um, I'm based in Lebanon and I've worked in English language teaching and teacher training for many years. Um, but I think this is the first time I've done such a big webinar. So this is a, a first for me and I'm glad you're all with me today. So let's get started. Uh, oh, yes, right, great. Okay. <laughs> So you can see the title of today's webinar and hopefully you're all here for reasons. Uh, we're looking at making writing fun and we'll be looking at particularly primary and secondary learners. If you're here and you're thinking that's not me, don't worry, many of these activities will be applicable to adults too. So this is what we've got in store today. I thought I'd put a menu because uh, I haven't had my lunch yet. So we're going to start with uh, talking about attitudes to writing and how we can influence these. Uh, moving on to the main course, uh, we'll be looking at ways of making writing fun. Um, and that will be looking at group writing, writing to real people and creative writing games. And then for dessert today, um, what to do next. So as usual in a webinar, in a professional development session, it does involve some work from you. So um, I will be asking you some questions during the webinar and also to consider what you might do as a result of what we've talked about today. Okay, so let's start off by thinking about this, our students' attitudes to writing. So I have a question for you. In the chat, I'd like you to write an adjective that describes what your learners think about doing writing tasks in English. So if you go into your class and say, we're doing writing today, what do they think? Okay, I'm seeing, I've seen one positive word, fabulous, so far. I've seen difficult, a lot, uh, bored, grown, I can see there. Uh, freedom, there's a positive one. Interesting, another one, oh, crying, oh dear, and stress. Okay, um, so I guess this is why we're here today, is that often, writing in English or even in their first language in fact is something that students might find difficult or challenging um, or boring or a pain. Um, so what we're going to do today is to try and look how we can change this for our learners. Okay thank you very much for all of your input there. So um, I had to think about what influences attitudes um, and these six categories I've got here um, you could apply them to any attitude really what influences our attitudes where do they come from and I thought about these six, six things so um, it could be a prejudice could be an idea that we already had um, it could be parents or families are quite influential on students attitude right so they could tell the, the kids, it's very important that you write in English or, uh, you know, I really enjoyed English. So that could influence how students feel about it. It could be about their personal experience of writing, either with you or with another teacher. It could be feedback they've had about their writing that influences their attitudes. Uh, the media, perhaps not so relevant in this case, but certainly the media can influence our attitudes. Uh, number five social factors so what does everyone in the class think about writing so if everybody's saying oh that was so difficult that test was so hard or that writing was so boring um that has an influence on other kids in the class right we've seen it and then you get this kind of group mentality um, towards something it works in positive as well as negative ways i should say and finally number six um direct instruction so, how can we use this? 
what can we influence from these six things? I'd like you in the chat to write the number or numbers of which of these factors you think that we as teachers can influence in terms of our students' attitudes to writing. All right, I can see lots of threes and sixes, a couple of ones. Again, really, oh, got all of them on there. <laughs> okay, a couple of fours and five, lots. Okay, I think what I'm seeing here is mainly threes and sixes, um, and that's good um, because that's what I'm going to be focusing on today. So what I want to propose is that we can influence our students' attitudes because we can affect their personal experience of writing in your classroom. And we're going to look at ways that you can do that. And part of that is, of course, direct instruction. So these are things that we can certainly influence. We can influence the things that our students write, what we ask them to write. We can influence uh, who they write to, so who the audience for their writing is, and we can help them with how they write it. And to make writing more motivating, we can help to create activities that are creative, that are real, and that are fun. Let's think a little bit about why we set writing tasks in. Um, do you set writing to practice language? Do you set writing to practice writing? Are we asking students to write to express themselves, to be creative, to communicate a message or to respond to a message? Well, let's think about this with an example. So here is a not very inspiring <laughs> writing task, uh, absolutely not a task from a Cambridge University Press textbook. Uh, this is rather boring. Um, so the task is write five sentences using the past simple. Okay. Um, this is definitely writing to practice language, that's clear. Uh, seems to be one of the main aims, yeah, as people are, are typing in the chat. The other ones, well, yes, they have to make their own sentences. Okay, I suppose they choose what they write, so it's sort of personalised. A bit fun? Well, it might be for some people. It doesn't sound so fun. Um, does it involve real communication? Mm. I don't think so. So my argument would be if we focus on making writing creative, if we're helping our students to develop their writing skills, to express themselves and to communicate and respond to real messages, then they're going to be practicing language anyway. So let's focus on the creativity, the fun, and the real communication. All right, so um, first of all, we're going to talk about how to do writing in groups. And I'm going to look at a few different examples. And for each one, I will explain the activity briefly. Um, talk about why this is could be motivating for your students and also give a couple of examples about how you could do this online so i've seen yusuf say how do we do this online well i'm going to give a couple of examples as we go through um, for those of you that are teaching online at the moment all right so um talking about working in groups this is one activity that you can use and i like to call middle end. So for this you put learners into groups, could be groups of three to five. You'd set the writing task, whatever it is, whether it's a story or an email or a report, and you tell each group to write the beginning. 
when they've written the beginning, they move their papers to the next group. So then they read the beginning of what the first group wrote and they continue the writing. Then finally, when they finish the middle part, they move the papers again to the next group. They read the whole piece of writing, the beginning and the middle, and then they write the end. Just a couple of clarifications here. What are the other groups doing while they're waiting for the first group? Everybody is writing at the same time. So let's say you have five groups. Everybody in each of those five groups, they write that beginning. Then you move the, the papers on and everybody writes the middle of a, piece, a different piece of writing. And then you move the groups, the papers on again, and everybody writes the end. So everybody has written a real collaborative piece of writing. I hope that is clear. Okay, so how can we apply this for different ages? Well, here's an example with story writing for the little ones, very simple. So um, the first part is um, the introduction of the background, the characters. So it could be one sunny day, Billy the bunny woke up, right? That's it, they write the beginning and stop, they move it on. Then the next group write another event in the story. Could be anything. Billy the bunny decided to go shopping, whatever, I'm not going to do the story now. Then they move it on, write another event, and then they move it on and write another event until you get to the end of the story. For secondary, um, again, it could be a story. We can do stories with secondary as well, but here's another example of another more formal piece of writing. So for an argumentative essay, everybody starts by writing the introduction. You'd give them the topic, I guess, um, or you could get them to choose. Um, if you were doing a, a for and against essay, um, they write the introduction, pass it on. Then they write the arguments for, they pass it on. And as you can see, the arguments against, and then the conclusion at the bottom. Okay, so um, I've just seen a very nice um, adaptation in the chat saying, why don't we do this with music for kids? So that's a nice way to do it as well. You could play the music as they're writing. When the music stops, then they move it, the paper to the next group. That's a lovely way of doing it as well. Okay, so why is this uh, good? Why is this motivating, this activity? Why is it a good one? You can use it for any writing activity that has a beginning, a middle and an end. So I've put some examples here, um, but I think it applies to most pieces of writing actually. Um, it, includes in, encourages collaboration and speaking skills so we're integrating here um, creates a shared product so each piece of writing then has been done by lots of members of the class we've got reading skills because they have to read what the other students have written before um, and you can use it with primary and secondary and small or large classes so if you've got a very large class, you control the size of the groups. You don't only need to have three groups or four, four groups. You can have more. Okay, you can decide on the on the best. All right, let's go to the next activity. Um, I'm calling this a writing round. Uh, no peeking, but some of you might know this. Um, it was a game we used to play as teenagers called Consequences. I don't know if anybody has heard of this before. So um, you give the learners a question. For example, who was the man? And they write the response at the top of the paper. So for example, the man was a wizard or the man was uh, a very in intelligent businessman. Then they fold the paper over so that their sentence can't be seen and they pass it to the next group or the next learner. So this can be done one-on-one -on -one or in pairs or in groups. When they get the paper, they don't peek. They just listen to what you're going to ask and write the next answer. So let's say your second question is, who was the woman? They would write their answer. For example, you know, the woman was 
uh, a famous film star or the woman was um, a very intelligent scientist. Again, fold it over and pass it on. And they continue with you asking questions that then create a story each time they answer it, fold it over until they get to the end. And this is the best bit. They open it all up and then they see the whole story from beginning to end. And they have been part of that story. So here's an example of how that story might be. So this is a story about how um, two people meet and what happened. Um, as you can see, uh, not very likely, but <laughs> you know, it's up to learners here to use their creativity and their imagination. Um, and these are um, really, really fun. I've also just a credit. This example is I got this one from the website. Okay, so yes, wild forty. I mean, of course, who else would it be? <laughs> Okay, so what's good about this type of activity, it's very good for creativity, which is something we'll be talking about more later. Um, it's often very funny. It's a fun activity. Learners can write whatever they like. They're playing with the language. It does require collaboration and speaking skills. If you get people, learners working in pairs or groups to write their sentences together and they can decide what's the best thing we're going to write and everybody's giggling and deciding and again we've got a shared product at the end of the day all right so for those two which remember we're talking about group writing at the moment um, and i know many of you will have found solutions to doing this online already um, but here are just a, a couple of suggestions um, students if you're doing a live lesson uh, like this you could get students writing together with a, something like Google Docs where they can both write on the same uh, document at the same time. So that's a way to do group writing. Um, or they could, you could put them into breakout rooms if that's appropriate for the age of your learners and if you can safely monitor them. So um, not suitable for the, young, the youngest learners. But if your students are a bit older and you can safely monitor them, put them into breakout rooms, they write together and then they can send you their document and then you pass it to the next group by, um, by giving it, by mailing it to them. Or if you're not doing live lessons, if you're doing this asynchronously, which many of us are, and that's a very good option, um, they can write at home and send it to you and you pass it to the next student. Or you could post it on a shared website if you're using something like um, your, your institution has a website that you're using to post work. Um, or you're using Google Classroom or Padlet or any of these tools. Again, bearing in mind um, safety issues and access and making sure this is closed and only accessible for your students. All right, so we're moving to the next part, uh, the next main dish now, um, and trying to make sure that our writing activities are real. Okay, so um, this can be a way to motivate and make writing fun. And let's look first of all at opportunities for learners to write to real people inside the classroom. Now, usually when we ask our learners to write, they'd write something and it's for us, right? But I'd like to suggest they can write to each other as well. And we can do this in a real communicative way. And here's one example. So this is paper text messages. All you need for this is paper and pens. And to do this activity, first of all, you tell the learners who their partner is. Make sure they're not sitting next to each other. So they'll be sitting in different parts of the classroom. So Ahmed over here, your partner will be Muhammad. Okay, just raise your hands. Okay, Ahmed and Muhammad, you're going to be together, but stay where you are for now. So everybody knows who their partner is. Every student has a piece of paper and then you set the task. So they're going to write a short text message, for example, inviting a friend to their house. So they would write the text message on their piece of paper and then send it, so deliver it to their partner, okay? Their partner reads it and then writes a reply underneath on the same paper and then sends it back to their partner. 
uh, and then they continue until you get to the end, until, until you've achieved your aim. So again, really simple idea, but it's real. It allows students to personalise their writing um, and it's fun as well. Oh, and this is, I forgot about this. Um, this is a lovely, um, I got from a colleague in an online course um, who said another way to do this, once they've written their message, they fold it up and make it into a paper plane and they just fly it in the classroom, if this is okay in your classroom, um, and then they pick up the paper nearest to them, read that message and then write underneath. So again, you decide, um, if that's going to work with your students, is it too much chaos? Um, but that can be a fun way to start the activity off. And that makes it quite random as well to, um, to choose pairs. I can see some of you going, that's really fun. Um, it could be a reward, could be messy. Okay, again, yes, um, you decide. Putting mes message in a bottle, I really like that idea as well. Um, so yeah, thank you for your suggestions there. Yeah, we'll, I'll end up picking them up from the playground. Right, so just think about those things in advance before doing the variation. Okay, so we've talked about this, why is this good? It's got real communication student to student. Um, it does involve a bit of movement, either running after the papers or just safely and calmly delivering them. Um, it involves reading skills as well. And important this, it can be safely monitored. So, um, I mean, if, you know, if your students have mobile phones, you could get them sending real mobile phone messages in class, but you can't monitor or see what they're doing. So here, by getting them to write down, you, you can. And of course, that's um, suitable for, for primary and secondary. There's some lovely examples down here. Thank you. We've got making a paper ball and throwing your message. Um, I saw a classroom mailbox, which is lovely. Um, and those of you who are saying it's too much, keep it really simple. Make the task really, really simple. So it could be using the simplest of language. Just hello, send. How are you? Send. Good. And you? And send, like this. All right, um, and an online option again for this activity and I'm not talking about using mobile phones because again we've got some issues there about privacy and monitoring and so on, but you could do this by um, they post their message on a forum so it's public and you can monitor this. So the first student replies to the message and asks a question, the next student replies and asks another question and then you have a group conversation going on that everyone is involved in and for the next one underneath you could use the chat just as you're using now um, you could get them messaging each other through the chat publicly again so that you can uh, you can monitor those and um, I've just seen a question about how you know what about class size I would say for all of these activities, um, think about them critically and how they would work in your classes. But I would argue that this could work in, in any classroom. You just need to think about how they get their messages safely to each other. So there could be a bit of um, crowd control in there, but you are the best people to, uh, to manage that, I think. All right, so those are ideas for um, writing to real people inside the classroom, so writing to each other. But let's talk now about opportunities to write to real people outside the classroom. Now, um, a word here of caution. Um, I was very consciously thinking about safety issues. So what I am not suggesting is students writing to random people and, and setting up correspondence with, with strangers, um, but looking at ways to make what they write in class have a real communicative purpose so that it speaks to real people in the outside world. And one idea that I think covers this really well, you can see it on the screen there, um, is a class blog or a class magazine. Okay, this is something that your students create as a class Again, um, Britain, it involves group work, but it's talking to real people, a real audience. 
um, parents, the principal, um, people in the community, for example. So again, some of you have, uh, may have done this before, um, but ways to do this are, first of all, to make sure students understand what this is. So a blog or a class magazine is something that your class creates um, that has different articles or interviews or reports or whatever they want to include. You can think of it like a class newspaper and Hibba's saying she's done it, so wonderful. Um, you can show them examples. So like on the previous slide, you can show them um, a blog from different schools that have been done um, or show them a magazine or a newspaper. They think about what they want to put in it. Um, you can use this for project work. Um, so get them working in small groups to create their articles or their interviews or you know, puzzles or whatever they want, they want to put into their magazine. Um, and the motivating part here is that it, it's published. And again, depending on what's available to you in your context, this could mean handwriting it and putting it up on the wall. I've seen some people saying, yeah, we put it up in the hallway. That's a way of publishing because it's, um, it's on the school walls. Um, it's there for people to see. You can call it a wall zine. Yes, absolutely. Um, or a class magazine. It could be printed or copied. Um, given to parents, for example, or other students in the school, that's a real audience. Um, or if you have a school website, um, you could uh, discuss with the principal, of course, first of all, but um, maybe that could go on there, or you could have it as a separate blog. Um, and there's some quite um, accessible blogging um, websites that you can use to build very, very simply. Um, if you go to Edu Blogs, for example, EDU, blogs um, you'll find lots of examples and, and ways to do that if you're interested in setting that up for yourself yeah and as some of you are saying it's it's super motivating if people if your students know that their work's going to be seen so yes what's good about it it's real communication and possibly there could be a real wor world response um, so if you've got a blog um, you could enable comments, for example, screening them first, uh, obviously for safety um, reasons. Um, it's a way to showcase student work, and that's good for the students, good for their parents too. They'd be delighted to see. Great for projects. It's personalised. Um, it could involve coding if, you, if you're putting this on a blog. And that might mean you learn a little bit as well at the same time as they do. Um, and it's creativity as well. And I can see also some more um, things in the chat saying it helps them express themselves. It's authentic. Exactly. This is what I'm talking about. It's a real communicative task. As Sabine said, it gives students agency. How is it personalised, Abdul Rahman? Well, they decide what they're going to write about. So they have a lot of choice and agency in this. Okay, um, and if you're teaching online at the moment, um, again, you could use collaborative tools if, if that's appropriate for your students' age, um, get them writing together, writing their articles together, or writing alone and then their parents send it to their friends so they can collaborate in this way. In a live session like this, you could get them working in breakout rooms. Or you can still collaborate now um, by sharing the work on an, an, a, in a, on an online magazine. Somebody said they're using Padlet or Facebook, for example, um, to share student work. Just be careful on Facebook in terms of, of security, I'm sure, I'm sure you are doing. Um, but that's a lovely way for students to connect and still work together, even though they're missing each other, they're not seeing each other in class or seeing you at the moment. Sorry, was that you, Peter? Everything okay? Uh, yeah, everything's okay. Just uh, a few people are, are typing in the Q and A um, box, asking why nobody's responding to their questions. Uh, we're not doing question and answer until the end. So please, first of all, do not use the Q and A box. Please use the chat box during the webinar, and at the end, we'll have an opportunity for question and answer. Thanks very much, everybody. Sorry, Claire. Oh no, that's okay, no problem. 
Um, I just saw a question here saying, what's breakout rooms? Um, this is something that you can do on some platforms like this one, like Zoom, um, which means that you, when you're teaching a live lesson like this and you put students into different pairs and groups and they go into a room by themselves and work together. So that means that students are working online, but they're working just with their partner or just with three people. So it's like what you would do in class in group work, but it's done as part of um, an online lesson like this. Um, there are issues here about safety and monitoring. So as I said, when we talked about this earlier, do please only do this if you can monitor those. Okay. Um, right. Yes. Okay. Just in case nobody was listening. <laughs> and I know in fact, you've, there's been lots and lots of uh, input as I've been talking, but I would like um, of any other writing activities that your students could do to communicate with real people safely. This could be inside the classroom or it could be outside the classroom. But if you have an idea or you have done something, um, what have you asked your students to do? So we've got pen pals, for example, lovely. Um, interviewing and a survey, that's a really nice idea to do, a classroom survey. Um, letters to family members, that's a lovely idea, especially at the moment if perhaps they're not seeing um, their family members as much. Um, emails, yeah, letters to family seems to be a really lovely one. Obviously that has to be family members um, who can read in English because you want them to read in English. Um, grandparents, letters to senior grade, that's nice. Why not have students um, writing messages to each other um, in the school? You could have um, a message board in the school where people can write and reply to them. So lovely examples there. Thank you very much. And again, my last word on this is please make sure this is safe for your students. Oh, sorry, that last one, write to a teacher you missed. That's a lovely, lovely idea. Um, and some of you mentioned ePals, or I think I mentioned earlier about eTwinning. Um, that could be an option for you is to, get, is to work with another school, with an English class in another school in your country or in another country. Um, there, are, um, there are ways you can find those schools online. eTwinning is one of them um, where you can connect with English classes in other countries um, and have the students writing to each other. So that's, um, that's a nice idea to, again, make sure this is, uh, this is safe. Okay, right, uh, let's move on now and talk a bit more about creative writing because we have, um, we have already mentioned this, um, but Creative writing involves so much imagination and getting students to play with language um, that it can be a really nice way to encourage them to write and to get them to enjoy writing as well. So first of all, um, I'd like to make a case for using poetry in classroom. Um, and here it could be starting off with reading some poems for inspiration. Um, but the aim would be to produce pieces of poetry. And I've written a few examples here. Um, first of all, um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with haiku. Uh, these are short and very, um, what's the word, uh, systematic, very structured poems. I've got an example of one here. So they're three lines. They, I think, if Stop me if I'm wrong, I think they go five syllables on the first line, seven on the second, five on the third. I can see many people saying, yes, love it, love, love haiku. So that could be a way to um, introduce your students to some very simple poetry forms. Um, the next one, acrostics. Um, so there's an example of this down on the bottom right. If you see the Angry Birds poem, um, this is just fabulous, by the way. I found this on the internet posted by a mum and her six-year-old had written this. <laughs> so it just shows what kids can do when you give them the opportunity. Um, so, oops, I think, okay. I'm not sure if you can still hear me.
Yeah, we can still hear you, Claire. Okay, can you see, because I lost the presentation on my screen. Yeah, we've, we've lost a little bit of it. All well, right, okay. There's a sort of a grey box now? at the top. All right. Yeah, now it's fine, it's fine. Yeah, right. it's okay now, Claire. All right, <laughs> lovely. Okay, I can see lots of people writing the number of syllables, and that's wonderful. You can all... Uh, you can correct me and, and do that research <laughs> after the after the session. So um, as I was saying, an acrostic down the bottom. So this type of poem, as you can see, the first letter of each line then spells a word. So this actually said angry birds going down. So that's a really lovely creative one. Um, magnetic poetry. Well, the, the picture at the top, the hot evening outside, um, this is done using magnetic poetry. And this, I don't know if anybody has has seen this it used to be um, you could get little magnets with words and put them on your fridge and then every time you go past the fridge you make a different poem and uh, you know you can actually physically move the words around this way now there's a website called Mag magnetic poetry so if you have a connection in your classroom or if you're teaching online you can give your students the website and they can move the words around and make their own poems um, or for um, an, an offline option, they write words on pieces of paper and make poems by putting them together that way. Um, so, and again, that could be done as a wall display, which is lovely, especially for, for little kids. So poems are wonderful for rhyme and rhythm um, and poems can be written in groups as well. So you could get them working in pairs or small groups to create the, the poem. Okay, let's talk about drama next. Now, we often think of drama as a way to practice language by speaking, um, but we can get students writing as well before they speak. So here are some examples that I thought of. Um, one was writing and then acting out a role play. And I put in here, maybe recording it. This depends on the age of your students and consent from parents and child protection issues as well. So I want to raise those and just say, I'm not advocating the recording or videoing of your students. It's something you need to think about if that's appropriate and if you can do that safely. Uh, next one, they can uh, write and act a, a scene from a film. Um, they can do this as part of uh, reading if they've been reading a book. They write and act a different ending to a book or a film. Um, or the last one, they watch a silent film and then write the script. Um, I can see somebody said, I really like that silent film idea. It is wonderful. Um, and then if, if the film, let, sorry, let me explain myself. It could be a silent film like a cartoon with no words. Or you could use a film with words, but play it without words. They then write their own script and act it out. And then they can watch it and compare their ideas to the actual script. So there's different options there. And again, depending on what kind of technology and the age of your learners. I've also seen some examples here. I thought Mr. Bean is great for, uh, <laughs> for writing, you know, what's he thinking? What would he be saying? And also using puppets is a wonderful way to do drama with little kids. So thank you for those ideas. Okay, another one of my favorite games I just wanted to explain is one of these story writing games. And to do this, first of all, you need to prepare either words or pictures on slips of paper. So I've got post-it notes here, for example. Put your learners into groups. Each group chooses five pieces of paper. They don't look at them. They just take them and they, whatever they are, they keep them. And then they have to write a story that includes those five words. So this really include, um, encourages imagination. Um, it can be a lot of fun. You can use it to review vocabulary um, or review a topic that you've been using. It can work with all kinds of different writing. You can use this for an essay, for a poem, an email, a description, anything really. Um, but you're just adding that bit of extra challenge and interest by giving them words to include. And for, for the last point there, one way to make this into a game is to, um, if they've done this um, in groups, 
before they share their story with another group, they just show them the pieces of paper, the, the, the slips of paper, the five slips of paper. The other group guess what the story is, and then they read the story that the, the students have written, and they see how close their ideas were. So again, we've got lots and lots of collaboration. And as Yoni Mu says there, you're teaching vocabulary and writing at the same time. Absolutely, you're activating what they know. They'll be asking you for more words and help with their language as they're writing. And hopefully, you know, they're so into the task that they forget that they're writing at all. <laughs> That's what we want to happen, isn't it? So here's an example of this um, activity. Um, and, you know, you can imagine a story that might include those five things, let's say, you know, I, I'm not going to ask you to, to write it now, but it, it sounds like quite a, quite a mystery activity. Um, yes, so um, this is the low tech version, if you like. So this is writing things on bits of paper um, and you can involve students in this. You can get them to write words and phrases and put them in the box for everyone to choose from. That's that's quite nice as well. Or for a, an online or a high tech version, um, this is from a website called Wheel Decide, Wheel as in car wheel. Um, and what you can see on the screen at the moment is what to do under quarantine. But the point of this website is you can put in your own options. And when you click on the wheel, it spins. And when it stops, that's the decision. So this can be a nice way if you make your wheel with the words and the phrases in class or in your online class, you then click spin the wheel and wherever it stops, bing. Okay, you have to use that word in your story, write it down. Okay, and, and you do that four or five times for each group and, uh, and take the, the words that way. As I say, you create your own wheel with your own words. This is, uh, this is just one uh, example. This is wonderful for speaking as well, by the way, but uh, that, that's, another, that's another conversation. Okay, we've just got a few more to look at in creative writing. This is one of my favorite activities is to give um, students a picture or a photo or they choose a picture or a photo, talk about what they can see in the picture and imagine how this could be part of a story or an event and then they create a piece of writing based on it. So you can use this for, and I'm sure many, many of you are already doing this, and particularly with primary learners, um, is, is giving them a picture and imagining the story and then writing the story. Um, but you can use it for factual writing as well. Um, it could be to do with a newspaper report or an interview, um, or it could be to do with something more formal. It's, it's completely up to you, but it's a really nice way to stimulate imagination. Oh, I love that idea. What happens when you go through the door from somebody? Really, really lovely idea. So over to you now, one more task. Um, here are two pictures. So we've got picture A, the helicopter, picture B, the child. I'd like you to have a look, choose one, and then just really briefly, how could you use A or B with a creative writing activity? What would you do? So if you would choose B, just type B and then say what creative writing you'd ask your students to do with this. I'll give you a, a bit of thinking time. I'd love to see your uh, suggestions in the chat. Actually, I can't see any suggestions, but I hope that you can. <laughs> Perhaps my chat has just frozen there. Um, some things I was thinking, uh, there's one from Lynette there saying something descriptive. Absolutely. Um, you could for B, you know, write a, a poem about what about this child. You could write um, a description of uh, her life. Um, you could write, you know, what led up to this moment, for example, it could be a newspaper report um, or A, again, could be a newspaper report, report of a rescue. It could be a script for um, a role play between the rescuers and the rescued and um, lots and lots of things that we can do there. 
All right, and the last thing um, I'd like to uh, suggest linked to creative writing is to add some art in there as well so that you can get your um, students designing using colour, using shape, using their own photos to make their writing really, really special. Um, and I know this is something we often ask the little ones to do and then we sort of stop. But why? Because, you know, it, for all the things that we read, for the things that we consume, our news, our media, it's all about photos. Instagram is all about photos and images these days and images add to um, the message of the writing. So just a couple of examples of things you could do. I really love this, by the way, I found this on the internet. I think this is a great way to play with words and colour for the little ones. Um, I don't know if anybody's seen this before, um, but it's from a poet, uh, I think it's a poet, it's a poem from Alice in Wonderland. And this is one way to play with writing is to have it going in different shapes. Um, and there are some tools you can use online to do this, or they can do it themselves um, on a, a word processing document, or they can do this by hand. So that's one way to be arty. Um, here's a lovely acrostic um, that a primary student has decorated and used colour for. So that's, you know, it's not just about the words, but the whole experience. And of course, it doesn't have to be done by hand. You could use um, uh, paint, for example, or any application on the laptop or um, what your students are familiar with to, to really make their writing stand out. And here's an example of putting them together. So we've got images and we've got um, some lovely fonts and a, a student there presenting their written work in a really, really creative way. All right, so that brings us to the end of my bit. Um, and just as a little recap, um, we've talked about number one, doing group writing. Number two, we've talked about um, doing talk, uh, uh, writing to real people for a real communicative, real communicative purpose. I've been talking for too long. Um, and that could be people inside the classroom or outside. Um, we've talked about creative writing to let students play with language. And we've talked about using images and video and, and stories to inspire students to write. So for the last thing I would like you to do is to look at these five suggestions from today and choose which number or numbers you think that you would like to do for this session. So if you're interested in doing that paper text messages, um, you might type in number two. Um, if you're thinking, oh, I really like those word art ones, you might type in number four. Um, and I'll just give you a moment to read those and type in your numbers. All right, and I think those numbers will come through as well because there are so many people um, typing at the same time. I've just seen many, many of those um, ideas of pictures A and B. So thank you for all of those really lovely creative ideas. Um, and it sounds like your, your classes are super already, but I hope you've got some ideas from today that you can take forward and try in the future. And your students will then hopefully be influenced a bit and will hopefully change their attitudes a little bit towards writing. Okay, so just a quick recap. This is what we've looked at today, attitudes to writing and how we can influence these. And we've looked at ways and means of making writing fun, group writing, writing for real people, creative writing games, and just finished our dessert now was what you're going to do next. So that's it. Um, I guess this is coffee if we've just had dessert. And um, we'll finish off if there are any questions. Great, thank you so much, Claire, for a wonderful um, hour of amazing uh, creative activities uh, for teachers to use with their students. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, but just a few questions. 
uh, one question which came up quite a lot, Claire, was um, about assessment and how we can actually assess or perhaps evaluate is a better word. Uh, how can we evaluate some of these creative writing um, activities that you've been telling us about? Um, I mean, I, I wouldn't say it's that different from how uh, probably you're already assessing uh, writing is that you're looking at particular criteria um, so that students know what you're looking for in their writing um, and you're giving them feedback on those criteria. So, for example, if you've asked them to write a poem, um, you need to be very clear about what, what you expect and um, how you'll be giving feedback. And that could be certainly the use of their language, but also creativity. Also, have they followed the structure in the way you wanted them to? Um, and also, if you're asking them to, uh, to decorate and use art in their poem, you could include some feedback on that as well. But I would say, however you're assessing your, your students' writing, is make sure you've got some um, response to the message of what they've written, first of all, um, rather than only focusing on, you know, spelling and grammar and things that often hit us first, don't they, as teachers, and we think, oh, I need to correct this and I need to correct that. But also look at, uh, holistically as well at the, at the writing, um, you know, how well has this student um, developed since the last piece of writing they've done, and um, what was okay. the message, have they been creative, and so on. Okay, great, thank you. And sort of leading on from that, another question um, about evaluation. If students are engaged in, in group writing, so the group is producing just one piece of writing, uh, the question from somebody is, do all the members of the group get the same evaluation? even if yeah. they're producing one piece? Yeah, I think, I think that's a good question. And, and that's really up to you to decide, but that's a good way to get everybody working together. Um, and you could also give um, them a criteria of how well do they work as a group as part of this activity. So, you know, it's not just the piece of writing that comes out at the end, but also a part of group working and collaboration is listening um, talking, negotiating and agreeing. So um, I like to put that into my group writing as well. Um, but certainly I think, you know, give it value when you're doing group writing and, and don't just have it as a practice. So I think you can at times use this for, uh, for evaluation purposes as well. Okay, great. Um, any other questions? Um, ah, somebody, a couple of people are asking for the name of the website, Claire, when you had the wheel, um, the quarantine wheel. Oh, I yeah. Think, what what <laughs> it's was the wheel website? wheel decide, which is a brilliant um, pun. Wheel as in the car wheel, decide. Okay, so W-H-E-L-D-E-C-I-D-E, -E -E, wheel yeah. decide. Yeah, I, I can't type in the chat. because. Uh, no, sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. Don't worry. Some people already shared the link in the chat. Yeah. yeah. Um, there were a couple more links as well. There's Magnetic Poetry, just those two words. That's a, a site that I mentioned. Um, and Edu Blogs for um, website and class blogs as well is a good one. Okay. okay. Great. Great. Thank you uh, once again, Claire. That was a really um, exciting and engaging <laughs> Uh, webinar. So thanks for all your hard work. I can see from the chat box that uh, everybody uh, really, uh, really enjoyed it. So thanks again for, for all your hard work in putting that together. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks.